Hello, everyone. This is Melanie, and welcome to our webinar on what AFib patients should know about the Cabana trial featuring Dr. Douglas Packer. So this is Melanie Truhills, your host for today's webinar. I'm an atrial fibrillation patient. Uh, next slide, please. And I'm the founder of StopAFib.org. I've been AFib free for about 13 and a half years now due to a minimally invasive surgical ablation. Once I was AFib free, I couldn't stand on the sidelines and watch other people suffer like I had. So I started StopAFib.org, a nonprofit organization to help those living with AFib to get their lives back. We were created by AFib patients for AFib patients. Well, I'm at the farm today uh, where my internet speeds are downright glacial, so I won't be on the video today. And to support me, we have on our host team, Melissa and Brenna, whom you may know if you've been to our patient conference in the past. As you may be aware, our annual Get in Rhythm Stay in Rhythm Atrial Fibrillation Patient Conference is coming up August 9th through the 11th in Dallas, Texas. One of our faculty members of the conference is our guest today on this complimentary webinar. I'm so excited that he's joining us on the faculty for the conference and really just couldn't wait to introduce him to you. Next slide, please. So our featured presenter today is Dr. Douglas L. Packer, MD. He is a consultant in the Division of Cardiovascular Diseases, Department of Internal Medicine at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He's the director of the Heart Rhythm Services and the director of the Translational Electrophysiology Research Laboratory. He's recognized with the academic rank of the John M. Nassif Senior Professor in Cardiovascular Diseases and is internationally known in cardiac electrophysiology. Dr. Packer is active in numerous medical societies, including being past president of the Heart Rhythm Society. He's on the board, uh, on the editorial boards of a number of journals. He's given more than 1,400 invited lectures in 37 countries and has written or co-authored more than 280 publications. He has served on the executive committees of a number of National Institutes of Health clinical trials and is the international principal investigator of the NIH-funded Cabana study. He does extensive research and holds U.S. and European patents in the development of intracardiac ultrasound and 4 and 5D imaging. His complete bio is on the page where you register. That's at getinrhythm.com slash packer dash webinar. And importantly for us at stopafib.org, Dr. Packer was the 2018 recipient of the Eric N. Prostowski MD Advocate for Patients Award. And that was that he received at our Get in Rhythm, Stay in Rhythm Atrial Fibrillation Patient Conference last year. It is rare for patients to have the privilege of hearing from such experts and thought leaders as Dr. Packer, except at our co patient conference. And those who have attended our conference know that he is very informative and fun to listen to as well. And it's a huge honor to have him with us today. Next slide, please. So today, from Dr. Packer, you'll learn what the Cabana trial is, what it revealed about the effectiveness and safety of catheter ablation, and what was learned about patient quality of life from the trial. You'll learn the trial's important implications for AFib patients, including specific subgroups of patients, and which aspects of the Cabana trial caused controversy and the truth behind those stories and Dr. Packer's expert take on all of it. You'll learn what impact the trial may have on treatment guidelines and future research and more. 
And this webinar is made possible through Biosense Webster being a corporate sponsor of StopAFib.org. So Dr. Packer and I will share with you all in the time that we have together today, all that we can, and I promise to show you before we're done how you can get more information. So Dr. Packer, thank you so much for being here today to address our questions about the Cabana trial. So let me turn it over to you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Melanie, for the introduction. Um, it always makes me nervous when I get an introduction like that. Um, you know, what we try to do is we try to do a good job in taking care of patients with atrial fibrillation. And the rest of it, you'll have to decide how uh, worthy the presentation is. But at the end of the day, I hope that we cover a lot of different things that are important to you and we'll also have time for questions. So what I'm going to do is start straight away about the latest that we know about atrial fibrillation. Now there's a fair amount of that that really is cabana. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the past studies that set it up, why we did the cabana trial and then what it showed and what it means just the way that we described. Now it's important for me in giving a talk like this that I tell you about disclosures. The first part of this has to do with advisory boards that I've been on, and it's important to know that I don't receive any money for doing that. I don't receive any money from any one of them, and particularly I don't receive money from Biosense Webster, who is sponsoring uh, this presentation. They had nothing to do with putting it together, though. The next has to do with funding that we've had for different research studies. And there's a fair amount of this that went into the Cabana trial and other research studies that we're doing. And then down at the bottom, it has to do with patents that we have and intellectual property. And uh, we do receive some royalties for that that go right back into the research that we do. So that's the introduction from my standpoint. You know, the big issue is what, what really are the goals in AF ablation when we're trying to do it? And basically, we're trying to deal with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and those who have on again, off again, triggered atrial fibrillation, all the way to permanent atrial fibrillation that is there and won't go away. Now, it turns out that if it's permanent, then that's typically substrate driven. So th that has to do with the underlying heart disease. If it's paroxysmal and that's, it comes and goes and comes and goes, that's more of a trigger dependent. So those that might be listening at the end of the day, it's the issue where if you have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, then there may be one or two cells that are rapidly firing. If it's persistent, it has more to do with reentrant wavelets. And we'll be talking about ablation with those as well. So now, back in 2010, I made this slide about who should undergo ablation. The first question is, well, what about people at stroke risk? Well, it turns out that those aren't the ones that we'd recommend for either drug therapy or ablation. These are the ones that really need to be on warfarin or perhaps Xeralto or uh, Apixaban, you know, one of, one of those drugs. They do a better job, and so we leave it up to those drugs to deal with the stroke issue. Now, there's some patients that have a TICM. What does that mean? That basically means that they have a tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy, so that they're in atrial fibrillation for a long period of time, and their heart rates are very rapid so that the ventricle doesn't pump as well. That is a reason for somebody to go, undergo an ablation. What about the fear of morbidity or mortality risk? Are people going to die because of atrial fibrillation? Well, if they have a major stroke, they might. And it turns out if they have atrial fibrillation that lasts for a very, very long time, there could be some risk there. But I think we have to be careful and we have to stay away from the fear. Maybe even stay away from the fear that paroxysmal atrial fibrillation will go chronic. In other words, the rapid tachycardia that occurs and comes and goes and comes and goes might turn into something that's permanent. That could happen, and it does in 30% of patients. But we don't ablate because we're afraid. We really do the ablations because we're looking for quality of life. 
and we ablate patients who have symptomatic atrial fibrillation. So they've got symptoms that clearly correlate with the ECG recordings. So if, if you're there and you have new onset atrial fibrillation or you think that you might, probably the most important first step would be to find out if in fact you have it. And that would be done by getting a monitor tracing or an EKG that shows it. So now what about the latest AF ablation trials? Well, paroxysmal again is it comes and goes and comes and goes. Now here I'm showing a number of different ways that we have used balloon type devices in order to eliminate atrial fibrillation by ablating the pulmonary veins. Uh, this one is a cryo balloon. Here's another cryo balloon. And these are new ones that are radio frequency energy balloons. This just shows that if you do it and you're successful, that it blocks off the place where these triggers are coming from. And this is a laser balloon. So those have been used. And this is a study that we did a couple of years ago with the cryo balloon. And we found that if we did that kind of ablation, about 70% of patients didn't have any more atrial fibrillation. On the other hand, if they were treated with drugs, only 7.3% had AF elimination. So there's quite a difference between whether you do an ablative approach or you do a drug approach. Here's another study that was done not too long ago by Carlos Murillo, and it was called the RAFT trial. We call a lot of the trials some particular name. The Cabana study that I'm going to show you here in just a second is Cabana. Um, it, you know, it stands for catheter ablation versus antiarrhythmic drug therapy for atrial fibrillation. This is RAFT. And what you're looking at here on the y-axis is what's the hazard that you're going to have a good outcome? That's not a hazard. That's a good thing. <coughs> if you look with antiarrhythmic drugs, there is a much greater chance that you're going to have a recurrence of atrial fibrillation than if you are catheter ablated, according to this trial. Now, it turns out that this went for a couple of years, and these are patients that had not had atrial fibrillation before. So again, patients who had a drug therapy didn't do as well as those who were catheter ablated. So let's talk about RF versus cryoablation. Here's a study that was done. This one was done by Carl Heinz Cook, and that was done in Germany. And again, what it shows is the patients with primary efficacy. In other words, it worked. And here you can see that there wasn't much difference between ablation with a cryo balloon and ablation with radio frequency energy. About 50% were free from any abnormal arrhythm, uh, or rhythm problems. It's a little bit lower than what we would like, but at the end of the day, this fire and ice study really gave us a lot of good information. The other thing is the patients on cryo balloon tended to have less all-cause hospitalization. The patients who are underwent radio frequency energy are the ones that had a progression and more underlying uh, atrial fibrillation. So here the cryo balloon did well from the standpoint of freedom from hospitalization versus radio frequency energy and freedom from all-cause rehospitalization versus radio frequency energy. Now, there are other studies that show that they really are fairly equal, and what we're interested in is quality of life. Here's another one that just came out called CircaDose. It's cryo versus RF. And some of you, when you come in, ask, well, should I have a cryoablation or should I have radio frequency? Here, the outcome was really the same. Again, event-free survival, and you can see that it drops as people have recurrences, and then as you go along in time, it stays pretty stable. So here we would say that whether it's cryo or whether it's RF, it's fairly important to understand that either one can be great. It really depends more on whoever's doing it and the experience that they have. 
Well, persistent atrial fibrillation, this is just one study from Spain. Again, you see that those who were ablated did better than those who underwent drug therapy. Again, this is the survival probability of being free from atrial fibrillation. And this, if any of you have watched Princess Bride, I think it tells you about some of the conflict that I'm going to tell you about in a minute here. This is, uh, it says, my name is Idaho Montoya. You peeled my father, prepared to fry. So large scale clinical trials, this is where we get into Cabana. And so now what I'm gonna do is tell you about this randomized study that took us nine years to do. There were 2,200 patients enrolled, 1,100 were randomized for ablation, and another 1,100 were randomized to drug therapy. It was a coin toss. About 90% were ablated. There were 102 that were not ablated, and that was for a variety of different reasons, and 90% completed the trial. You could say that these are crossovers, and they started out as uh, supposedly going into the ablation arm, but they went into a drug arm. On the drug therapy side, 99% were treated, but 301 crossed over to ablation. And the reason why they crossed over to ablation is that these patients had you know, recurrences and uh, or side effects from the drugs. If you look at completed follow-up, again, about 90% uh, had completed follow-up. Now, we wanted to know whether or not ablation versus drug therapy was better from the standpoint of the primary endpoint, which is death, disabling stroke, serious bleeding, or cardiac arrest. So those are things that can happen uh, with any type of treatment for ablation. And this is by intention to treat. What it means is you look at all the patients who are in the ablation arm and you keep them in the ablation arm, even if they were to cross over, you do the statistics in the ablation arm. On the other hand, if you're looking at what's going on with um, drug therapy, those patients stay in the drug therapy arm, even if they cross over. The thing that we saw is there really wasn't a whole lot of difference. So from the standpoint of the primary endpoint, when you used the approach that kept everybody in the arm of original randomization, there wasn't really a lot of difference. So we couldn't say that ablation is gonna make you live longer or that it's going to decrease the number of strokes. The thing that decreased the number of strokes was NOACs or drug therapy like Eliquis or Xeralto or dabigatran that would prevent strokes. On the other hand, a real big difference was like the other studies that I showed you, the patients who are ablated were much less likely to have a recurrence. So here you'd say that that group had no recurrences whatsoever. On the other hand, as it drops down, that's where patients have had recurrences over time but the ones that are on drug therapy had much, much more in the way of recurrences than that with ablation. And you know the st statistics that we use were intention to treat. The hazard ratio is 0.52 for those of you who look at hazard ratios, and it was highly significant. This is some work that Gene Poole did in looking at the risk of recurrences after a 90-day period where we sorted out ongoing therapy. Again, you can see the recurrences over time up to 60 months, much higher on drug therapy, much lower on those patients that were ablated. The same thing if you're looking at atrial flutter or atrial tachycardia, which can occur after the fact. Another thing that we found is AF burden. That's a big deal. AF burden uh, is basically a quality of life issue or how much time you spend in atrial fibrillation. And the AF burden was greater in drug-treated patients than it was in patients ablated. But both groups started out with a fair amount of atrial fibrillation. If you look at persistent atrial fibrillation, 70% of patients had that, and it was basically 70% of the time. 
after ablation, the patients did well. The patients who were on drug therapy did not do as well. Let's see what happens with age. I think that that's kind of a critical interested in. Now this is, I'm not of internet connection, lean at risk of AF recurrence depending on age. So the higher the line, the more recurrences they had, the lower the line, the fewer the recurrences. And what we found out is if patients were ablated, whether you were under the age of 65, between 65 and 75 or over the age of 75, didn't matter. Patients who were ablated did better than did those who were treated with a drug. Now that doesn't mean you can't use a drug. Re using a drug is, is reasonable. It may not be as effective as ablation unless you're over the age of 75. If you're over the age of 75, then drug therapy may be the same or maybe even a little bit better for recurrences. Now, if we look at mortality rates for stroke or bleeding, this curve looks at event rates. So the higher the curve, the more events, the more deaths, the more stroke or bleeding that occurs. Now, this is interesting because in the ablation arm of patients over the age of 75, here now for the first time is very, very uh, interesting because at this point, the patients who were ablated had a higher event rate than did those who were treated with drugs. On the other hand, if you look at those who are down around 65 or 65 to 75, they did very, very well. I think it's important to know the cabana showed again that with with higher age there may be cases where a drug approach is better from an overall standpoint of mortality or stroke but even in the older age group ablation is better from the standpoint of preventing recurrent atrial fibrillation what about heart failure similar again the lower the bar or the lower the curve the less problem there was. The higher the curve, the greater the problem. So in the ablation arm, whether they had a heart failure or not, then the event rates were lower. In the drug arm, the event rates were higher. So that suggests that even in the presence of heart failure, there may be a, a very good outcome with ablation. There have been a number of studies that have suggested that, but we need to see a little bit more about this before we really uh, go, go digging or making pronouncements about you know, patients need to be ablated um, if they've got heart failure. That might be true, but this paper has not been presented yet. On the other hand, if you look at clinical outcomes, patients who had heart failure did better from the standpoint of the primary outcome did better from the standpoint of mortality, did better, uh, did about the same, I guess, as far as mortality or cardiovascular hospitalization. And from the standpoint of recurrent atrial fibrillation, both groups did very well. So if a patient has heart failure, that's not a reason why you wouldn't ablate them. But in many cases, a better therapy for these patients would be to treat the heart failure. How about quality of life? This is from Dan Mark. You look at the bars, the quality of life was not good by the baseline scores, but as time went on, quality of life was better or the scores lower in the yellow bars in patients ablated or in the green bars in patients who were drug treated. And that gives us a little bit of a red light uh, as to how might, that might be best handled. There's another uh, approach here when we use an inventory score called MAFC by intention to treat, that here on this side of the line, drug therapy did better for quality of life, according to Dan Mark. On the other hand, ablation was better. And it turns out that all of these are on the side of ablation, suggesting that the quality of life actually is going to be better by these kinds of analyses 
than drug therapy. So we have a, a bunch of issues here with AF disease. One is what kind of arrhythmia is it? Is it persistent? It's there all the time? Or is it paroxysmal that comes and goes and comes and goes? Well, it's been well established that ablation can be very effective in paroxysmal and persistent. In patients who have chronic atrial arrhythmias, then it may be a little bit uncertain. On the other hand, if you look at this upper right-hand corner, it depends on how many atrial fibrillation episodes somebody's having, what the duration of the episode is, how long have they had it since diagnosis, and here the percentage of time being in atrial fibrillation. If we look down here, some of the issues for AF disease severity is quality of life and the need for hospitalization. This tells us about the patient's experience. On the other hand, some of this is a little bit subjective. If you look further, there's stroke or symptomatic pauses or complications of either therapy. In these, these kind of assess the impact of the disease and the attribution of events of atrial fibrillation could be a little bit imprecise. It could be the underlying disease, not just the atrial fibrillation. And finally, there are issues like left atrial size and fibrosis and left ventricular function and comorbidities and valvular heart disease or heart failure that play a role. So all of these play a role in just how bad a patient's symptoms might be and what the risk might be. When we did Cabana, here are the complications that occurred with ablation. Here are the complications that occurred with patients receiving drug therapy. And surprisingly, all of the numbers are pretty low. There are a couple of things in ablation where patients got severe chest pain, one got pulmonary vein stenosis, one got damaged, or none got damaged to um, the esophagus, which is good news. These all have to do with drug side effects. So I think times change, and as we've gone over the last year since we presented Cabana in the first place, there are people who were skeptical. They were thinking that, well, there was no mortality benefit and there was no benefit in overall complications. It turns out if you just look at the patients who actually received the therapy, so not the ones that just were stuck in an arm and left there, but if you look at the ones that actually received therapy using per protocol or using on treatment analysis, it turns out that in those groups, looking that way, patients with ablation did have a better outcome in terms of mortality. It's a different kind of analysis though, and you have to be careful about the analyses that are being done. And the intention to treat is the very most uh, structured, it's the very uh, least conservative, or maybe you would say conservative, depending on what side of the fence you're on. But if patients cross over, then intention to treat can have some problems with precision and it may push the benefit to that line in the middle where it's kind of equal. And so as we've gone through the last couple of months or the last six months, we've published the paper and that's available. And then there have been some ch changes in times and how we approach things. It's kind of like in 1998, we said don't get in a car with strangers. In 2008, we said don't meet people from the internet alone. And in 2018 with Uber, we say, order yourself a stranger from the internet to get into a car with alone. Well, that's a little bit tongue in cheek, but as the time goes on, then there'll be changes in the way we ablate. But for right now, let's look at Castle. Castle looked at 179 heart failure patients versus 184 that were treated conventionally. And there is a difference between ablation and conventional therapy. The relative risk reduction was 38%. And if you look at all-cause mortality, there is a difference. Castle-like cabana 
has some issues and controversies. And, and I think that it's important for everybody to know that if you're using intention to treat, then some of the outcomes don't look as clear cut with either trial. If you're looking at patients who actually get the therapy, then it may look better. But the real issue is for you. You know, what should you do or what should a patient with atrial fibrillation do? Nothing I have said mandates that you have to have an ablation or you have to be treated with drug therapy. Either one may be beneficial, certainly from the standpoint of quality of life or a decrease in recurrence, then ablation takes the day. So what do we conclude? <clears throat> Number one, you kind of have to know what your target is and you have to stay awake. So those of you who have atrial fibrillation need to be treated with an anticoagulant in many cases, not all, but there may be out there your target, which is preventing a stroke. And if you're not watching and if you're not getting the therapy, and sometimes with ablation versus drug therapy, the same thing happens. And you have, so you have to be very, very careful and make sure you keep up on it. So what do I think Cabana says about ablation? I think it confirms prior observational and other randomized clinical trials. I'll give it five stars for ablation. It says that ablation is an effective way of eliminating atrial fibrillation. I'll give it five stars. Ablation is acceptably safe. I'll give it four stars because there are some complications that can, can occur. It reduces mortality or cardiovascular hospitalization. If you look at it together, ablation does better. We give it three stars. Is it effective in persistent atrial fibrillation? That's one of the changes that I was talking about a second ago. That's gone up from three to four stars. Is it highly effective as first-line therapy? The answer is that's now five stars. Cabana was looking at first-line therapy. But is it effective for reducing mortality in other events or reducing mortality by intention to treat? You really can only give it two stars because that's not the reason why we give drugs or the reason why we do the ablations. We really do the ablations for quality of life and to eliminate the atrial fibrillation. It may well be that if you look at the alternative treatment modalities, in patients where they actually got the therapy of ablation versus drug, that it may be better, particularly in heart failure. There still are a bunch of these that we have to prove. And at the end of the day, I give that one four stars. So this is kind of my conclusion with all of this. And what this is, is this is the guidelines and how the guidelines will probably change with Cabana more persistent atrial fibrillation will be eligible for ablation. More patients will be eligible for first-line ablative therapy, and more patients will be eligible for ablation in heart failure. Now, that really concludes what I have to say, except for, again, I want to remind you that which approach is best for you has very much to do with what kind of atrial fibrillation you have and what your risks are. Not everybody needs to be ablated. Uh, in some cases, in those over the age of 75, or in some cases where drugs may be equally effective, we don't mandate the patients have to be ablated. On the other hand, there are many cases, and this clarifies it, and basically tells you to a greater extent of where we think things are going. And so Cabana suggests that at least for elimination of atrial fibrillation or quality of life, that it's a very good approach and it's very effective. So I'm gonna stop with that and uh, thank you very much, um, Melanie, for inviting me to uh, be on the airwaves here. And uh, now those of you who are watching can decide if her, um, if her introduction was appropriate or not. In the meantime, I wish you the best and especially those of you who have atrial fibrillation. Thank you so much, Dr. Packer. And I think you proved, and then some, um, why we adore you so much in the patient community, uh, knowing that you just tell it like it is. And we greatly appreciate that. 
and we also greatly appreciate what you have put in to doing this cabana study all all these many years um, that has really been your life's work for a number of years and it has been extremely valuable for patients to see what the results are from this study that you have invested so much in. So I do have some questions for you, Dr. Packer. Okay. And, but before we do that, I'd actually like to fulfill what I promised everybody before we got, you know, got started. And that's that we promised we'd, you know, share all that we could today um, in the time that we had. But I want to take a moment to show people how they can get more. And we're really excited that Dr. Packer is one of our faculty members at our Get in Rhythm, Stay in Rhythm atrial fibrillation patient conference, which is going to be in Dallas at the Fairmont Hotel, August 9th through the 11th. And so I want to give you a quick preview of the conference so that you can check it out after this webinar. And you'll find out more about it at getinrhythm.com. Next slide, please. So at the patient conference, we'll have world-class faculty uh, who, like Dr. Packer, are experts in AFEB. And these innovators and pioneers will share all aspects of managing and treating AFEB. We're assembling uh, the photos and bios for the website, but let me highlight a few of those who have agreed to speak. So in addition to Dr. Packer, we'll have Dr. Eric Prostowski, who's shown in the upper left, um, and he's a leader in electrophysiology, editor of the Journal of Cardiovascular Electrophysiology, former Heart Rhythm Society president, and member of our board of directors. Uh, we'll have Dr. Hugh Calkins from Johns Hopkins, who's another former HRS president, and a leader in the development of global AFIB guidelines. Uh, Dr. Andrea Natali, who's in the picture in the middle uh, with Dr. Packer, who is a true catheter ablation pioneer and innovator. We'll have catheter ablation experts, Dr. David Callens, Dr. Mark Link, and Dr. Randy Lee. Jody Hurwitz, who is an electrophysiologist with expertise in gender and lifestyle issues related to AFib, will be there, along with Dr. Amelia Benjamin, whose photo is in the lower left. Uh, she's a leading expert in epidemiology and genetics and has been a leader in the well-known Framingham Heart Study. We'll have Dr. Elaine Heilig, who's a leading expert in stroke prevention, and Dr. Peter Coey, an expert in AFib medications. Dr. Ralph Damiano, who's shown in the upper right, is a top surgeon who was the protege of Dr. James Cox, who was the creator of the Cox Maze procedure. And Dr. Randy Wolf, who's in the lower right, is another top surgeon who created the Wolf Mini Mace. And we may have some surprise faculty as well. There will be truly life-changing content and education from these experts. Next slide, please. So when you go to the website, you can scroll down the page to see the two and a half day agenda. And you know, what will be covered. So on the first day, Friday, we'll focus on AFib and risk factors, gender, ethnicity, and lifestyle in AFib, medications, stroke prevention with medications and devices, and have a panel of experts to discuss how to work with your doctors to get the best care. Next slide, please. On the second day, Saturday, we'll focus on catheter ablation starting with catheter ablation procedures and tools, then how AFib evolves and how to ablate complex AFib. Dr. Packer will cover what does Cabana tell us and where are we going with ablation. And then we'll have an AFib surgery a session about open chest, mini maze, and hybrid procedures. And then what do the guidelines tell us about treatment? Then we'll have a panel to discuss how to choose the right procedure for you. And you can even submit your case anonymously for the panel to discuss. And then, next slide, please. On the third day, Sunday, we'll focus on digital health tools for AFib, including the Apple Heart Study with the Apple Watch. And those results were presented on March 16th at the American College of Cardiology. And I was on the study steering committee, and we'll have a lot to say about the study 
including giving you the facts to refute some erroneous media reports that you may have seen. And then I'll wrap up the, the conference with what we call living with AFEB. And that's um, things that you haven't that you know haven't been addressed during the rest of the conference and then there's an opportunity for the community to share with each other and this is a very powerful session so next slide please when you attend the conference you'll have the opportunity to ask the faculty members your questions in the Q&A sessions during the breaks even over lunch and you get to know others with AFib and get answers from them too next slide you also have many opportunities to visit with sponsors and ask about their devices and medications. And here you see Biosense Webster and Boston Scientific. Next, please. And the venue is absolutely the icing on the cake. It is a lovely luxury hotel, which previous attendees have raved about. And our amazing event planner got us hotel rooms for only $129 per night plus taxes. These rooms often go for 200 to 500 a night during meetings and events. And the food is amazing there too. Attendees always rave about how delicious the food is and one attendee even likened it to being on a cruise. Next please. So you're probably wondering, okay, what does all this cost? Well, it's unbelievable at only $197. If you've ever been to a conference, you know that most conferences cost a thousand or two thousand dollars and that doesn't even include food. So for your one hundred and ninety seven dollar investment you'll get two and a half days of expert presentations by these world class experts. And that includes the live Q and A opportunities, time to visit sponsors and opportunities between sessions to talk with the experts and other patients. It also includes two delicious lunches and five snack breaks and the cost of your food alone is several times more than what you're paying. It costs us about $425 per person each year and thankfully the sponsors are covering, um, helping to cover many of those costs. Next please. And for only $30 more, just $227, you get an all access pass that includes the Friday evening VIP reception and that's where you can have the beverage and hors d'oeuvres and that generally costs us about $85 to $100 per person. So that's a bargain too. And uh, you can be there when we present the next Eric N. Prostowski, MD, Advocate for Patients Award. And Dr. Packer received that award last year. So you can meet the recipients, Dr. Prostowski, Dr. Natalie, and Dr. Packer, and the newest recipient of this year's special award. Next slide, please. And you can sit down and visit with and ask your questions of the world's most famous AFib experts. Get up and close and personal with them and get to know other AFib patients too and benefit from their experiences. So this is really truly a priceless opportunity. So now let's move on to questions for Dr. Packer. So, so Dr. Packer, um, you talked about the results, you know, as they relate to effectiveness and safety of catheter ablation and the impact that catheter ablation has on patient quality of life. You talked about subgroups such as age and, you know, and heart failure. And um, you talked about the crossovers and, you know, you know, what was found by looking at the data in various ways. So have the Cabana results changed anything about how you treat AFib and in what ways do you think Cabana may change treatment for AFib patients overall? I, I think there, there are a couple of ways. Number one, almost always before we required a patient to have been treated with an antiarrhythmic drug and fail it. So if they've been on a drug and they fell it, then they would be um, a candidate for ablation. So that's changed where now we're offering ablation as first line therapy. Um, the quality of life information and the burden uh, is a difference. And so that, you know, patients ask, well, am I gonna feel better? And is my quality of life gonna be any better? 
And we had to tell them based on previous studies that we weren't completely sure. I think we're more sure now. Uh, I think that uh, at least as far as the data go right now, patients who have heart failure and atrial fibrillation, we're more likely to go ahead and treat them with ablation in addition to heart failure therapies. And so I think that that's different. We still can't tell a patient that you know they're gonna live longer. And so I think that that is something that needs to be very, very clear. But at, at the end of the day, we tend to move quicker, more quickly to uh, an ablative approach. Um, I'm a little bit more comfortable in telling patients about the safety of ablation because now we have a lot more data. So th those are the general areas that uh, change things. When I uh, talked with patients during the first couple of months after the ablation report or cabana report went out, then I would say something like, well, we're waiting for the results of a large trial to give us the answers. And then I'd have to stop and say, wait a minute, we have that trial. It's already been done and it's already <laughs> been uh, reported. And you did so it. I think there's, there's just a, a little bit more or a lot more certainty uh, on those issues. So, and that's, that's fantastic. So um, you gave us some insight into what impact the results may have on the guidelines. Um, what do you see as needed future results? Or do you think we have all the answers that we need at this point when it comes to ablation? Well, when it comes to any therapy for any problem, especially something that's as difficult as atrial fibrillation, I think it'd be you know, inappropriate to say, gee, we now have all the answers. You know, there's a controversy in Cabana and Castle. And so, no, I don't think we've got all the answers. And I think a separate study is going to have to be done with more patients with heart failure to be more definitive about that. And I think that there, with that sort of information, I think we'll know a little bit more about whether being close to a mortality advantage is worth anything. Right now, we can't claim it. And so the, those are the those are the issues at hand, and and you know I'm I'm sure that as technology changes, then there'll be more and more studies that'll need to be done to test that technology. Mm -hmm. So we've heard a lot of um, the naysayers saying, "Well, we really didn't see any benefit when it came to strokes and death," but. I think that one of the things that's important from this study is that since we know that most people were on anticoagulants and, and you saw very few strokes and deaths as a result, that actually is good news. Um, I, you know, I don't understand those who are saying bad news because we didn't really see a difference. I see that as really good news. Can you share with us a little more about your thinking on the area of stroke and, and death as it related to AFib? Well, I think we can be pretty dogmatic about you know, quality of life and freedom from recurrence of atrial fibrillation. The stroke issue, we were hurt by the fact that patients were taking their anticoagulants as they should have been. <laughs> and so the anticoagulants worked. And so the, the risk of stroke decreased substantially, and it just kind of tells you that it's the drug therapy that really carries that um, protection, not necessarily an ablation. And so I think you have to be you know, careful, and I think that patients who have um, more persistent or chronic atrial fibrillation and have CHADS VASC scores, a risk of high blood pressure or diabetes or prior stroke or age over the uh, age over 65 or 75. Um, I think that, you know, patients who have had coronary artery disease, patients who have had heart failure, I think all of them have higher CHADS VAS scores and they, re they just need to be on anticoagulants. Right. And, and so um, I actually think that that's an important part of Cabana because it kind of uh, confirms that a different kind of therapy is gonna be better for dealing with that particular issue. So Cabana helped in a, in a lot of areas. It didn't prove that ablation was perfect in all areas, and thank heavens it didn't, 
because I don't think I would have believed it. But I think it just says that, you know, you need to be looking to the anticoagulants if you are going to deal with stroke risk. Absolutely. And um, I think it's really good news that we saw uh, the quality of life results that we saw. Um, I know that when you first presented this in last year at Heart Rhythm Society, and that was before the quality of life data had come out, um, there were some naysayers who said, well, you know, we can't tell the difference between uh, drugs and catheter ablation. And our, as the patient community, our feeling was that it's really not so much about the stroke and death as it is our quality of life. Because AFib takes over our lives, at least for many of us it does. And to see the quality of life data um, shows us that there are advantages, certainly, in, when it comes to quality of life from catheter ablation. So um, are there any additional things that you want to say about the quality of life data that was seen? Uh, it just was, it was very, very consistent regardless of uh, the approach, the statistical approach that we used to get at the information. You know, I, I think at the beginning, uh, you know, a year ago, uh, there were naysayers and uh, most of them were uninformed. They hadn't seen the data. Right. That is because it hadn't been published yet. And I think now that people have seen the publications, I think they understand better. And I also think they understand that ablation is not for everybody. And, you know, I don't, I certainly don't want my commentary to be coming up over as an advertisement for ablation. I think that ablation is better in the areas where I said drug therapies in the, is better in, in other areas. And I just think that this has to be individualized and we have to get the right therapy for the right patient. Right, absolutely. So um, I wasn't planning necessarily on answering some questions, um, but a few questions have come in. Let me ask a couple really quickly. And um, for the rest of those questions, hopefully, you know, you can come to the patient conference and um, discuss those with Dr. Packer. Um, one of the questions is, does original Medicare cover ablation therapy? And the other question is, you know, um, this person had an ablation 10 weeks ago, still having a little bit of AFib. Is that considered a failure? So CMS and third-party payers, um, you know, they all have rules and guidelines. And there are some outside of CMS that are concerned more about a second or a third ablation. We really haven't seen a problem with first ablation. And with CMS, I, th I think it's, fairly, it's been fairly consistent that they do cover it. Uh, whether or not that'll change over time is something that we'll simply have to wait and see. So I, I think that at the, at the end of the day, you know, you really need to check with your third party payer just to make sure that it is covered if that's what you're going to do. Right. The, the other issue was somebody who had been ablated recently and they're still having some atrial fibrillation. Well, if they're having atrial fibrillation and it lasts longer than 30 seconds, we do call that a failure. In Cabana, we did call it a failure. But of those with recurrent atrial fibrillation in the first three months, one third, it'll go away because it's due to the irritation of what was caused with the ablation. One third will still have atrial fibrillation, but drugs will work, even though drugs didn't work before. And one third have a problem that's ongoing and maybe they're gonna to need to be on drugs for a long time or on you know, another ablation or something like that, I wouldn't worry very much about recurrence of symptoms in the first three to six months. I, I, and I definitely would not try to re-ablate them in that time frame because so many, in so many, it, it goes away. So um, I just, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, I'm, th I'm through with it. Uh, that just is a good question. Right. So um, that really kind of brings up one more question. We hear from time to time that insurance companies are turning down people who are 75 plus 
of forgetting ablations. Are you seeing that? And do you think these results will have any impact on that? Um, you know, I, I have not seen that. You know, we, we haven't had that issue here. Um, over the age of 75 from the standpoint of quality of life and from the standpoint of prevention of recurrences, it's just that the difference may not be quite as great as it is you know, in some of the younger patients. So no, I would, I would not say that a patient who's over the age of 75 shouldn't have an ablation or couldn't have an ablation. I think what the issue is, is you have to be realistic about uh, the issues. It's not gonna make them live longer. It's not gonna prevent strokes. What the real issue is going to be, they still may get a substantial benefit in terms of uh, recurrence of atrial fibrillation, but um, you know, any third-party payer, I'm sure at some point they'll relook at all of this and make decisions about what to and what not to um, pay for. Okay. So, Dr. Packer, thank you so much. This has been extremely valuable and enlightening, and I'm sure that. It has also probably raised a lot of questions in people's minds, and you know they may want to come see you at the patient conference in order to ask you more questions. So thank you so much for taking the time to um, educate us today about the Cabana study and what it can mean for us. And as patients, it's really an honor for us to have you here with us today to enlighten us on uh, what the Cabana study results mean to us. And also I wanna thank everyone who has attended for empowering yourself to take control of your AFib. Uh, Melissa, next slide please. So uh, if you wanna hear more and meet Dr. Packer, please plan to join us at the 2019 Get in Rhythm, Stay in Rhythm Atrial Fibrillation Patient Conference in Dallas. And uh, why should you be there in person? Well, you wouldn't look at a picture of your favorite restaurant meal and consider that as satisfying as actually going out and eating and enjoying it. So it's the same with the conference. It's just not the same to, to watch it on live stream if we're able to do that this year. And we rarely know more than a couple of days beforehand if we're even gonna be able to do that. You really wanna be there and get to hear the experts, the pioneers, the innovators, learn about the latest treatment options and you know what you need to know. Ask these experts your questions and even ask them more questions during the break and meet other AFib patients and share experiences with them. So showing up in person matters to you and to your family. One attendee said that he got thousands of dollars worth of value just from talking with the doctors during the breaks. And you can't do that if you're not there. And the first people to sign up for the conference usually are the ones who've attended before and don't want to miss out on getting the latest life-saving information. And you know we don't want you to miss that either. So we have people who have come from as far away as Canada, United Kingdom, Europe, and even as far away as New Zealand. Um, if you're still not sure, please take a moment to watch the video highlights from our last conference and read the testimonials from those who attended previously. Next slide, please. So in order to get a personal and intimate experience. We only have a limited number of seats, so we don't want you to delay and miss out on your chance. So please go ahead and register, put it on your calendar, get your plane tickets or plan to drive and, and make your hotel reservations. You can get the special conference hotel rate from three days before until three days after. So you can make it a vacation and stay and enjoy Dallas. Um, we're right in the middle of the Dallas Arts District and there's so much to see and do. So please plan to be there with us. And we look forward to seeing you all in Dallas in August at the patient conference. We hope you'll come meet and ask your questions of Dr. Packer. And thanks again for attending our webinar today. <laughs>